Bless the Lord, everyone, and welcome to another of our Bible study as we look at the mind of Christ. Um, before we move on, let us just pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. Dear God, we thank you for bringing, bringing us here today. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit will be here and that it will lead and guide us into your truth. We pray, O oh God, that the word that we speak to here will not, that we speak here today, will not fall on deaf ears, O oh God, but that we will apply it to our heart and that we'll be changed by it. Let your will be done as we give you all the glory. You alone is worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, welcome again to our Bible study. Um, today, as I said before, we will continue looking at our series, um, The Mind of Christ. Let us look at the outline. So we we'll start off by looking at the um, parable, some of the parable of, parables of Jesus, why Jesus spoke in parables, what is a parable, parable of, of um, we're going to look at some more in terms of a parable of the sower, um, the parable of the prodigal son, time permits, we look at miracles of Jesus, some of his miracles. We're going to look at also the definition of a miracle and look at some of his non-healing miracles. And um, in detail, we we'll look at the first miracles that, first miracle that he did. Okay, so let us uh, continue. So what is a parable? A parable is a simple story used, used to illustrate a moral or, or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the gospel. Um, we said that the parables are normally, you know, usually concise. Now, why did Jesus spoke in parable? <clears throat> so if we should look at the Bible definition of why he, or should I say the Bible, re the reason the Bible gave for him speaking in parable, um, there is actually a couple of scriptures that speak to that. The first one is that, um, is that the disciples said, and the disciples came unto, him, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Um, and he replied, And to hear those things which he, he hear, and to have not heard them. All right. So let us look at the scripture in Matthew thirteen and verse ten to seventeen we look at that discourse between Jesus and his disciple as to why he spoke in parables. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? So naturally, Jesus' disciples was asking, you know, why he spoke? He spoke to, to the multitude in parables. Because notice he said, spoke to them in parables. Apparently, Jesus would, would speak to his disciples plainly. But then when he was speaking to a large multitude, then he would speak in parables. And this is, um, this is Jesus' response. He, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them that is not, but to them it is not given. So Jesus said that to you, the disciples, I, it is given unto you. You are supposed to know the things of the kingdom, but to them that are without, you know, it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he has. Therefore spake I to them in parables, because they seen see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing he shall hear, and shall not understand, 
and seen, he shall see and shall not perceive. Okay, so I think we, could, we can stop there. So Jesus says that um, because, you know, Jesus explained this is why he spoke to them in parables. Because, you know, they, their heart weren't really right at the right place. And so he didn't speak plainly to them, but he spoke to them in parables. Um, let us, and there are a couple other references that you can look at. Um, Mark 14, verse 11, I think it's, it captured the, the same essence of what is being said here. So this is a list of parables of Christ. Now, um, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. This is not all the parables, but this is just a sum, um, some of them. So we have, and in no, no particular order, just a list of parables. So we have the parable of the sower. We're going to look at that one later. We have the parable of the weeds. We have the parable of the mustard, the mustard seed. We have the parable of the yeast, parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the pearl, you know, the pearl of great price. We have the parable of the lost sheep, the, lo the parable of the lost coin, and also the prodigal son. And we are going to also look at the prodigal son later. Okay, so these are, uh, as I said, just a list of some of the parables that Jesus um, Jesus used in his ministry. Now let us look um, in further detail on the parable of the sower. Now there are a couple references to this parable. We can find um, it in Mark 4 verse 26 to 29. We can also find it in Matthew 13. Um, so I want us to bring up the the scripture in Matthew. So it's Matthew 13. Um, I run about verse 3. Verse 3, he says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had not root, they withered away. 37 says, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Um, verse 8, But other fell in... Sorry. And other, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some of some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some fortyfold. And Jesus in his prayer by saying, Who hath ears to to hear, let them hear. Amen. And so this is what Jesus would have spoken to the multitude. This is what he would have said to the multitude. Now, he would have now probably take his disciples aside. Verse, in fact, if we just continue from at, with ver, at verse 10, you know, the, the writer said, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parable, we, we, you know, we read this already. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Um, now, if we should go down to verse 
18, if you should go down to verse 18, Jesus actually interpreted interpret the parable for them. So from verse 18 down to verse 23 gives you the interpretation of the parable. Now when you read it in the Bible, it sounds as if Jesus does, you know, gave the parable and then give the interpretation after. But then when we actually read it between the lines, we'll see that Jesus actually spake the parable to the, to, the, to the multitude and he gave the interpretation to his disciples. Um, and this seems to be a trend or some, a pattern, something that, something that he will do often. So he said, hear therefore the parable of the sower. So now he is now explaining the parable of the sower. He said, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. Okay, and he went on to speak. Um, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy received it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while, or endureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. And verse 22 say, He also that receive, receive the seed among thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cure of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receive the seed into the good, into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, so Jesus now went through and he gave the interpretation of the parable so that his disciples might know, you know what the parable means. And so a lot of the persons in the crowd would probably would have now gone away really not sure what Jesus was talking about today, you know, because he wouldn't have explained the parable to them. Now, let us look at the interpretation that he gives. The first thing he said is that the seed is the word. The seed is the word. And that's very important. It is very important for us to understand that the seed is the ground. Sorry, that the seed is the word. The seed is the word. And the soil represents the various type of heart or the various type of person that will receive the word. So the fact that the seed is the word, and I always use this illustration when I, when I speak about this parable, it is, the, it, is, it is really the word that determines the, what is grown. Uh, it, really, it is really the seed that determines what is grown. Um, if, we have a mango, if we have a mango seed and we plant that mango seed, then we are going to get a mango tree. Well, that is, that's very obvious. Um, if we plant a pear seed um, and, you know, water it and do the necessities, then a pear tree will grow. Um, and so having this knowledge that, the, that is the, word, the word of God is the seed, it takes, I believe it takes the pressure from off us. Because sometimes when we look and see all that, the, all that God requires of us to do and, and the level of righteousness he wants from us, sometimes it can be a bit, you know, we can become perturbed at what is required. But if we can understand that the, it is the word that is going to bring forth these things of itself, 
you understand? And all we have to do is to ensure that we, we plant the word in our heart, as it were, and we ensure that we do the necessities in terms of watering it and whatever is required for it to grow. The word will grow of itself, you know? And so it's not necessarily through our um, mental effort that we are going to produce righteousness. But righteousness will be the offshoot when we sow the word of God in our hearts. And so we need to sow the word. We need to, to sow the word, literally sow the word in our heart. And if we do that, then the word will grow. And, the, and the, 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 the offshoot, the product of that will be a life of righteousness. Um, I often use the example and ask the question, what is the difference between a grain store and a farm? What is the difference between a grain store, like a farm store that sells seed, and a farm that plants seed? What is the difference? Well, the difference is that, well, let me, let me start with some of the similarities. Some of the similarities is that, you know, there is a seed. There is seed there. Both of them have seed. We, I, I, I worked at a grain store um, for a while. And so when you go to a grain store, you'll find a lot of seed there. You'll find many seeds, all different type of plants. And they are there on the shelf. But what you won't find is a lot of fruit. You won't find any fruit there. Because why, why you won't find the fruit? Because the, the seeds are not planted. The seeds are on the shelf. You know? Um, I liken that to a person who have a mental appreciation for the word. They, they, they know the word. They can quote the scripture. But it, guess what? It's not in their heart. They have, not, they have not hide the word in their heart, but they have it in their mind. They have, it, they have an intellectual understanding of the word. Now, the word does not grow in the mind. It grows in the heart. Just like how we say that in our grain store, the seeds, seeds don't really grow on shelves and bring forth fruit. Yeah, you find one of them might bud if they get some moisture and all of that. But they don't grow and bring forth fruit. You know, because they are, they are on the shelf. And so it is important for us to get the word in our heart. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart so that I will not sin against thee. And so it's not just to read it, but we have to plant it. We have to um, get it in our heart. We have to break it down as it were. We have to um, embrace it. And let it become a part of our value system. And so when we do that, we, 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 we accept that it is true and it is right. And then, if, you know, it is in our heart. We receive the word. And so, and so the first point is that the word, the seed is the word. And the seed is what is going to bring forth the righteousness. It's not going to be by your own effort in terms of you just willing yourself to do what is right. But it is when we will become righteous or we will become righteous and bring forth fruit unto righteousness when we hide the word in our heart, when we plant it, when we nourish it, and when that word mature, it will bring forth righteousness in us. This is what Jesus was saying here when he speaks about the sower and the fact that the seed is the word. The flavor of the fruit is not determined by the ground but it is determined by the seed, you know? And so, you know, what we, what we ultimately come, become is dependent upon the word of God or should be dependent upon the word of God if it is truly sown in our heart. Now, what does the soil determine? Well, the soil determines the, qua the quantity that may be produced. The Bible says some bring forth 40, some bring forth 60, you know? Different folds, different amount. The abundance might be determined, the soil might determine the abundance of the fruit that comes forth. So if it is a fertile soil and you plant the tree there, then you probably bring forth a, 
a lot of mangoes, and you know, whatever the fruit is, you may get a, a great quantity of those, you know. A less fruitful soil will bring forth mangoes just the same, but it won't bring forth as much. But it's not going to, if you plant, essentially, if you plant the same seed in different soil, you're going to get the same fruits. But the quantities that you get back is, is going to be different. And so we are all, and so the Bible likened us unto the soil. And so we are all, um, we are all, different types of soil. Hopefully we can all be good soil. And even within the good soil category, you find that some bring forth different amount of, of the, 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 the fruit. Okay? So, so in terms of um, it, the soil, let us look now at each one of these soil um, individually. So the first one, the Bible speaks about is the wayside. The wayside. Now, what is a wayside soil? A wayside soil is really like a pathway, right? So, if you have a if you have a farm, if you have a farm, then you will have a grow a, 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 a path to the farm that's right beside the farm, and so that is really the wayside. It's really the sidewalk. We we, we today would call it probably the sidewalk. And so this is really a piece of ground that is not really prepared. You know, normally a, far, a, a, a farmer would prepare his ground to receive the soil. Um, um, when you look at the scriptures, I think in Isaiah the scripture speaks about break up your, your follow, follow ground and sow no more among thorns. Now, breaking up of the ground is part of the process of preparing the soil. The farmer would go through, now in the country they would probably use what is called a fork and they would literally plow the ground and break it up, you know, so that it, it, is, is, it is favorable to, to produce. Um, in industrial, more industrial countries, they probably use some big equipment to, to break up the ground. Um, and so the, the farmer will prepare the ground for the soil. Now, what I'm saying here is that the wayside is, you know, the, 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 it's not really a ground that is prepared. Um, but it's just, the seed does end up falling there, right? So Jesus says that for the wayside, the, in, this, in the parable, he says that the fowl of the air came and 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 take up the word, right? That's what he said. Now, here in the interpretation, Jesus gives us what is the fall of the ear, right? He says, when, they, when, when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. So in the parable, it says the fall of the ear. Now here he says the wicked one are Satan and catch it away the, that word which is sown in his heart. So Satan come and catch it and take it away the word. So, 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 so from this we you know, understand that the fall of the ear is really the devil. Now Jesus gives the interpretation here. The question is, when you read the Bible, you may come up across the term again, use fall of the ear or you know, maybe a, a slight variation in the term. And the question is, is this, is, 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 uh, does the interpretation here fit that? Can you, can you translate it? Um, it's really an interesting discussion among some scholars that will say that, well, you know, if Jesus gives you, a, for example, here the fall of the ear means the Satan or the devil, and you will find that some persons say that you will find that consistently through, throughout scriptures that when the Bible is mentioned in the fall of the ear, it's probably speaking about the devil and some people like that. That's arguably, you know. Um, but it's something, that I said, that is out there. But here Jesus gave us this description where this parable, the sower, is concerned. And he, he tells us now that the fall of the ear is really the devil. And he came and, and snatched the word. Um, he said that the person don't understand the word. So the wayside soil don't really get an understanding, a full understanding of the word. 
And so the devil came and, and catch it away. Now, let us look at the other side. The, 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 the scripture says, But he that received the seed in a stony place, the same is he that heareth the word, and annoy with joy, receive it. Yet he not, yet he hath, yet he not root in himself, he, yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth, I believe should be there, I'm saying endureth for a while, um, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, um, by and by, the person is offended and probably get fall away. So, so the wayside soil, I look at it as being people that are persons that are superficial. You know, um, there is no root. The Bible says there is no root in him himself. Has no root in himself. You know, but he he um, he will receive the word with joy. And as long as things are going well, he will continue with it, you know. But as soon as there's some hardship, as soon as there's some tribulation, that person falleth away. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that said that, that he that falleth in the time of tribulation is of little strength. I think that's how it goes. I'm, I'm quoting it from memory here. Um, and so here... And, and, and so this is what is being applied here. So this person um, don't, don't really have root within themselves, you know. Don't probably meditate on the word as often, you know, but it's a superficial in their approach. And the Bible says, as soon as they become tribulation for the, because of the word's sake, you know, they will fall it away. So that is for the rocky soil. There is also he, verse 22 says, he also that received the seed among thorns. So I think we have rocky soil there. Rocky, I think we have shallow soil there, but it should be thorny. He also that received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he bring it and he become unfruitful. Now this is the one that probably troubles me the most because the others, they will fall away. You know, the, the wayside, they fall away. The rocky soil, tribulation come, and you don't see them in the church anymore. Little hardship, you know, little building change, and you don't see them around anymore. COVID come, you don't see them around anymore, right? But the thorny one, they will stay. You know, the, 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 the scripture says for, for that one, they will stay. It's not that they fall away, but they stay. So they grow and they mature and they are in the, the church. But the Bible says that um, within this soil now, the word is choked. You know? The word is choked because of the thorns. And, it is, and the, Bible, the Bible says, in the parable itself, the Bible says, because of thorns. But here in the interpretation, Jesus tells us what are the thorns. He said the thorns are the care of this world, that's one, and the deceitfulness of riches, that's another thorn. The Bible says that it will throw the word and he become unfruitful. So the tree is there, but it probably don't bring forth any fruit. Um, again, the scripture that I quoted earlier, it says, break up your fallow ground. And then the other part says, and sow no more among thorns. So, so Jesus is saying, look here, I see you're sowing. The problem is not that you're sowing, you're sowing the word. But guess what? You are sowing the word and there are thorns there. The cares of the world is, is great. Now, we all have to live in this world. We all have to live in this world. And 
The fact that we all have to live in the world, it means that there are some things that we have to do. You know? And Jesus know that we need to do these things. But the, 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 there comes, there is a point in time when it's, it's cost, the, 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 there comes a point in time when the care for this world can become so much that it, it stifles your Christian growth. And that is when it becomes a problem. So five people can have the same job, you know, working the same amount of hours. But guess what? One of them is just faithful to God and it's not choking it, you know, and he's able to remain, remain faithful and bring forth fruit unto perfection. The other person, the same job, working the same amount of hours, doing the same amount of work. But guess what? He cared for the job so much that that in itself, you know, caused him to have a problem. And the same job, you know, choked the words. So you can't, you can't legislate it to say, you know, you must only work eight hours a day or whatever. You can't legislate it like that because it comes back down to the heart condition and it comes back, back down to the individual. And you have to make a, a decision whether or not you are going to allow the things of the world to choke the word, to choke the word. I remember when I just got saved and, you know, I got, a, I got saved and I got a job. I got a job. And, um, you know, I was working at a place. The job wasn't paying me much. But I was going to school in the evening. I was going to school in the evening. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to stay in this job until I finish school. Because, and my reason for doing that was that I didn't want to have a full-time job and then, you know, go in school in the evenings and then... I don't, you know, it choke the word. I, I make no, it, it, it begins to impact my Christian life. And pair of persons came to me and said, why won't you see the job, they don't pay anything. Why you don't look a good job? And I said, no, I'm going to stay until I finish. I was going to UTEC at the time. I said, I'm going to stay until I finish UTEC because school over early. I was, at a, I was at Calabar, working at Calabar at the time. School over at two, and so I had all that time to study if I need to study, to read the Bible if I need to read the Bible, and to pray before I would have to go to school in the evening. And so, what am I saying here? You have to make a judgment call. Other persons man juggle a full time job and a full time and going to school in the evening, and they are okay. In fact, I did it at a, at some other point in time. But at that time, I believe that, you know, that was the right decision to make. And I was, I was making it because, as I said, I wanted to protect my Christianity. The fact that I had just gotten saved, I wanted to spend time in the, the house of God, in the church, you know. And so each person has to make their own decisions as how much is too much. How much is too much? Yes, we have to live in this world, you know, and... We have to learn to do some things. We may have to go to school because we may have to learn to do whatever we're going to do for a living. We may have to learn it, you know. But we can learn some things. But again, as I say, at the same time, we can now give ourselves totally over to this. And it now will choke us where it impacts our Christian growth and development. The Bible also speaks about the deceitfulness of riches. You know, the Bible always knocking riches. Um, there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that speak about riches and this deceptiveness. And this is one of them. And so, you know, if you have a lot of things, it can choke the word also. And I think another translation also puts sin in there as something that can choke the word. Okay? So that is a couple of the soil there. We look at the... We look at the, the wayside soil, we look at the rocky soil, um, and we look at the thorny soil.
The next soil that we're going to look at now is the good soil. Now, verse 23 speaks about the good soil. But he that receiveth the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bring forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, so let us read it again. We want to just be careful here what the Bible said about the good soil. He says that the seed unto the good ground is he that heareth the word and understand it. So that is, that is important. We need to understand the word, understand what God is saying, understand what the preacher is saying, understand what the word of God is saying. So you have to understand it. The Bible says, which also beareth forth fruit. So what it doesn't say here is that, yes, this is a ground that doesn't probably have a lot of thorn in it. You know, that is taken for granted. It's also a ground that don't have, um, it's not a stony ground, it's not a rocky ground, it's certainly not a wayside ground, you know, but it's a good ground. And the Bible says the person understand which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth fruit. Some hundredfold, some of us is going to bring forth hundredfold, some is going to bring forth sixty, and some is going to bring forth thirty. But all of these ground are, I mean, this, for the good ground, all of these amount is, 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 is perfect, perfectly acceptable to God. You know, so don't watch a next man. That's why you know, there's many scriptures that speaks about that. He that compareth himself, you know, among himself is not wise. Don't look at an next person. Maybe you are just a 30 ground person. Maybe. Or maybe you can only produce 30 based on the type of soil that you are. Don't watch that. As long as you, you know, you are bringing forth fruit. Um, you know, that is what is important. Now, the question is, and the first time I read this parable and I wasn't saved, I said, boy, what if I'm a wayside, wayside soil? You know, or what if I'm a rocky soil? Uh, what if I'm a thorny soil? And it, it bothered me for a while, you know, but um, I come to the understanding that I believe that we all can be good soil. I believe every single one of us has the potential, has the potential to be good soil, right? Every single one of us also have the potential to be any one of these soil. So we can be a wayside soil. We can be a rocky soil. We can be a thorny soil. And of course, we can be a good soil. The, 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 the type of soil that you are is totally dependent on you, I believe. You know, I don't believe anybody just born being a rocky soil and they're just going to remain, be a rocky soil for the rest of their life. No. There are, you, everybody can be saved. Everybody can live for God. Everybody can produce fruit unto righteousness you know we all has the pot we all have the potential to be a good soil but you know it does come back down to the decisions that we make the things that we are willing to do and not do how we treat the word how we how we treat the things of god okay so that is the parable about the sower um it's a very basic parable but i believe it 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 there is a lot of truth there and um you know i think it's last week i said we are to find ourselves in the scriptures um well for here you can examine yourself honestly and and say okay which one of these soil am i and if you find yourself not being a good soil, you can make what are the adjustments that you need to make in order to become a good soil. All right, let us continue. So 
So the next thing we want to look at, the next thing we're going to look at is the prodigal son. Let us turn to Luke 11, verse 15. Sorry, Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. Um, so this is the parable about the prodigal son. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided it unto them. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that, in the, in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many, how many hired servants of my father has bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no, no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoe on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came, and draw nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not come in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. 
And yet, thou never gavest me a kid that I might have make merry with my friend. But as soon as thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf? And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever mine, and all that I have is thine. It was meet or desirous that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. All right. So that is the parable of the prodigal son. Um, this parable, it teaches that God never hinders a person from leaving, you know? Um, and so God will not force a person to stay. All right? as, as I said before, this is a parable. A parable is a, a story that is told that has spiritual truth that are hidden, right? Now, you know, we said Jesus would not necessarily hinder an individual from leaving, but he will always open for the person to return. That is the characteristics, you know, that's how God operates. Um, the backslider must realize their tragic condition and come to a decision. Now, uh, a decision must be reached before the return the return journey. Now, oftentimes I use this parable when I'm teaching um, repentance because this parable has all or most of the elements or the components of um, repentance. What are, the, what are some of the components of repentance? Some bright scholars can just type it into the, the chat. What are the components of, of repentance? So, you know, in no specific order, we have acknowledgement of sin. Um, we have contrition of sin or being sorrowful for, for sin. We also have, um, we said contrition. We also have a decision to forsake sin. That is also important for repentance. You have to make a decision to forsake sin. There is also um, what is called con restitution. All right? And um, there is a, I'm, I'm not sure which one I, I'm forgetting now, but there are five of them that we normally look at. Five elements of repentance, right? And as I said before, this, script, this parable has in most of them, if not all. Now, um, so the parable, as I said, it, it has the element of repentance. Where do we find, let us look and tell me, or you can let me know, where do we find the component that speaks to acknowledgement of sin? Somebody can type that quickly in the chat. What part of this parable speak to acknowledgement of sin? Well, I believe when he said, the Bible says that he, he came to himself, right? And he said, how much, you know, my father has... Um, let us see if we can find it and bring it up on the screen. So, as I said, acknowledgement, acknowledgement of sin is very important. Um, one, and, and it's probably the first step in coming to the Lord. Um, an individual has to first acknowledge to God that he is a sinner or agree with God 
that he is a sinner. You know, um, if the person doesn't see himself as a sinner, then the person will not see a need for God. You know, because yes, we know that there are several things that God does for us, physical things, but one of the biggest things that God will do for us is to provide salvation. And that is one of the things that he probably, are, oh, not, not probably, he alone can do that for us. Provide salvation. But before God can provide salvation and before man can recognize his need for salvation, he, he must first acknowledge that he's a sinner and see himself as a sinner. Um, you know, sometimes this is not just totally up to an individual. You know, the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that leadeth a man to repentance. You know, um, and sometimes even this is also a work of the Spirit acting upon the individual, saying to the individual, yeah, you know, look at how you're living. You know, this cannot be right. And the person come to a place where he acknowledged that what he's doing is wrong, the things that he's doing is wrong, and his need for salvation, you know? And so that's the first step towards God, um, recognizing that you are a sinner. And here we find the prodigal son recognize, you know, where he was, he says, and when he came to himself, you know, um, often, you know, this scripture can apply to a lot of us, and decision to serve God. It is a moment in time when we came to ourselves. You know, the Bible says, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? Yes, yeah, so for this parable, it was about bread and all of that. But for us, keep coming to ourselves is about acknowledging that we are sinners before God. Acknowledging that the way that we are living was wrong. And, and even after we get saved, you know, the element as we, as, we, as we live for God, there is need, there is sometimes need for us to repent again, you know. And again, the elements of repentance come, come into play, you know, where you, you are convicted about a thing, you know, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord will convict you about it. And you go through all the cycle of repentance again. So the first one is, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of them is um, certainly acknowledging that you are a sinner. Um, another important element in repentance is, you know, contrition for sin. Contrition really means being sorrowful for your sin. You know, the Bible says that godly sorrow for sin worketh repentance, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so it's not just when the Lord gives you a conviction or, you know, as, as sinners or even as Christians that are saved and probably fall in sin, one of the things that is important for us is to have contrition or be sorrowful. And we see that element playing out here also. The Bible says, the, 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 um, the prodigal son said to, to his father, you know, um, you know I, will, I will arise and I will go and I will say to my father, I'm sorry and all of that. So he had, there was contrition there. You know, he was sorrowful for his sin. Right? Then the, the, another element of repentance so we talk about acknowledging that you're a sinner. We spoke about um, being sorrowful for your sin. But all of that is not going to be enough if we don't make a decision to forsake sin. That's also an important element of repentance. Um, the Bible said in Proverbs that he that had it his sin shall not prosper, but he that what confess it and forsake it, that man shall be blessed in his way. You know, so um, so it is important for us to make a decision 
to forsake sin. And we see the prodigal son, he did that. You know, the Bible said he, he said, you know, I will arise and I will return to my father. He make that decision. Um, unsaved, if you are listening and you are unsaved, you have to actually make that decision. A lot of times, you know, our own conscience tell us that the way that we are living is, um, is contrary to God and that God is not pleased with our lives, you know, but we continue in it. But here, the prodigal son is, um, he, make, he made a decision. He made a decision to forsake sin. He made a decision to forsake sin. And we should also, you know, if you are living outside of Christ, you know, if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you are not saved, then, you know, you should also consider giving your life to the Lord, making that decision to forsake sin and to come and live for God. So that is the, that is the third element of repentance. Um, the next one that I was forgetting is confessing your sin. And so you have to confess your sin. Now, who do you confess your sin to? You confess your sin to God. The, 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 the scripture said that in um, the scripture said that in Psalms 51 that you know David said, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done and done this evil in thy sight. And so because it is God we sin against, he is the person that we should really repent to and not to man. I mean, I'm not saying you can't share with a brother a fault that you have that you probably want him to help you pray for. But in terms of con confessing and getting forgiveness for your sin, you know, you have to do that to God. So that's the fourth element. And the fifth element of repentance and as I said, we, we see here where the prodigal son did confess. You know, he went to his father and he literally confessed, even though his father kind of stopped him in his, in his trap. But he was confessing his sin to his father here, which is type of us confessing to God. Um, the final element of repentance is contrition. Or not sorry, we did that already. The final one is um, restitution which is um, to restore what is broken. Um, sometimes if we stole a laptop, you know, we can't really say we repent and we still have the laptop I use. You know, we have to return it and tell the person that, you know, we took it, but we are, you know, you know, we are returning it to you. So it's important for us to do restoration where, it's important, where it is necessary. It's not every sin that you commit, you can you can do a proper restitution for, but some you, you can, and if the Lord and the Spirit convict you, you know, then you really should do some form of restitution there. Um, now, the, so as I said before, the, par, the, the parable had having all of the elements of repentance. If you search keenly, you could probably find restitution there or the desire to, you know, when he said to his father, you know, take me back as a higher servant, maybe that could view as him trying to restore that relationship, I'm not sure. But, um, but at least four of them is there clearly. And if we search hard, we maybe can find the fifth one. Um, however, the parable was not told primarily because of the elements of repentance, but the, the, the parable was told as a response to how the Pharisees was acting and the Pharisees' attitude. And Jesus, so Jesus told them the parable um, to kind of uh, show them the attitude that they were displaying. And so the, here we find that the, the Pharisees was, had the attitude of the big brother and that is what I said before. That is the real reason for, for the, the parable being told. The parable, you know, the, the, the Pharisees had that attitude of the big brother where, you know, they were with God and they were kind of, 
yeah, they were kind of um, trying, you know, looking down on those persons who are not serving God. And, you know, we find this type of attitude in the church today. This type of Pharisees type attitude where we make it very hard for people who, who backslide to come back to God. You know, we make it very difficult. The things that we say, they are so hurtful. You know, they are, they are ridicule, you know, people ridicule the person. And I mean, all manner of evil, I'm not even going to go into some of it, but all manner of evil sometimes is said to prevent against a person that, that has fall, fallen and is trying to restore and trying to come back to God. We make it so hard. Sometimes a person does go to our next church because, because of us and because of the things that we'll say and because of how we'll treat the person. You know? But we have to be careful because remember, it's not we, the person, is coming back to. If you look at the parable, the son, nowhere in that parable did the son say, I'm going to go back to my bigger brother. He said that he's going to go back to his father. So we have to understand, it is not us they are coming back to. They are coming back to God. So we are to leave them alone. We are to allow them, if we can't help them, if we can't give them a helping hand, if we can't stretch out a hand and say something positive in them returning, better you don't say nothing at all. Just leave them and let God deal with them. Right? So they're not coming back to us. They are coming back to God. And it is important because when, I mean, I think this was a group of parables that Jesus told here. He told the parable of the prodigal son. He, he spoke about the parable of the coin, the lost coin. And he spoke about the parable of the lost sheep. The, these three parables were done um, one after each other, right after, right after each other. And, you know, he is he's making the point where if 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 we have a law if, if we have a sheep and that sheep get lost we would have we would have gone and searched for that sheep why because it's our sheep and we own the sheep you understand and there's a love that our owner have for the thing you know the reason why we sometimes give people a hard time to come back to God is because if we don't own them. If it was your son or your daughter that backslide and they were coming back to God, we wouldn't give them a hard time. Why? Because you love them. You know? And you care for them. And you know the pain it took to bring them into the world. You know? Well... It's the same thing with God. God is the one that gave his life for us, literally died for our sin. And so, you know, if it is, if it, you know, the fact that he gave his life, he is very vested in seeing people come back to him. You know? And so, as I said before, give them a helping hand, man. Say something positive, even if it's just a smile, a, a good smile from the heart, you know, you know, let them come back. And if you're out there listening and you're a backslider, you know, I encourage you, I, and you want to come back, I encourage you, I encourage you to come back. Don't allow anything to stop you. Don't allow anyone to stop you. Your salvation is worth too much. To allow what people say to matter. You know, make that step, like the prodigal son. Recognize that your state, you might be financially better, but if you are to be honest, if you are backslidden, you are not spiritually better. You, and you certainly is not better overall. You know, um, and as I said before, you know, there is grace and there is mercy. And the Lord will receive you like how he, the, the prodigal son received the son. You know, the Bible said it, he ran to him. You know, he ran to him. He didn't just, you know, wait. You know, he ran to him. Showing how, imp you know, how imp important it is. 
um, or how much he loved him, the fact that he will literally run to receive him back. Jesus will run to us. Jesus will run to you. If you, are find, if you find yourself in a boxes state, I'm encouraging you, you know, to come back out, come back out to God and he will, he will receive you. All right? He will receive you. And so that is the it about and um, with regards to the, par the prodigal son. As I said before, there are many, many parables that Jesus um, used in his ministry. Um, but we won't go to, we, we are only going to go to these two, um, really. And, um, yeah. So next we're going to look at his miracles, I believe. Yes. Oh, pardon. So, yes. Yeah, so we're going to actually look at one more. We're going to look at the rich man and Lazarus. Well, actually, this is not a parable. Um, this is not a parable, but this is actually um, believed to be a true story that Jesus told. So let us look at this. It is found in Luke 16, and we'll read from verse 19 to 31. So that's Luke. Chapter 14, all right, chapter 16, verse 19. There was, a certain, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, this is the rich man now, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip excuse me, the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them. So that's just a case in point. You see how specific it is here? It's not, it's not a parable, but it's really a true story. And the, the man literally died, and the man is saying that he had five brethren that, that left. That is there. So he said, For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. All right? So, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto the him, If thou hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, 
though one rose from the dead. All right, so let us quickly look at this parable. Just a few things I want to highlight here from the, the parable. From, I'm calling it a parable. From this story. So the first thing I said before is that the account of the rich man and Lazarus is not a parable, but is a true story. That's what we believe. There are some folks that believe that this is a parable, but um, others believe that it is not. One of the reasons why um, folks don't believe that this is a parable is because one, there is names that are being used here. Notice, if you notice most of the other parable, there is no names that are used. You know, the Bible says a certain, a saw, you know, a, a certain man, you know, he doesn't normally use names in the parable. But here, he's, he specifically talk about, he give the name, he talk about a rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus is the name of a man, you know. So it is, it is, this is one of the reasons why a lot of folks don't believe that this is actually a parable. And even in, its, in the start of it, you know, the, he didn't say it was a parable. And, you know, he, he spoke as, it, as, it was, as if it was a true story. So some of the things we want to highlight from this parable is that to the Pharisees, um, man's, man's riches, riches was a sign of divine favor, while the beggar poverty indicates contempt or God's contempt. So this was a view that the Pharisees had. And so that's why hearing this story really resonated or should have resonated with them because it was contrary, so contrary to what they believed because they believed that the man's riches was a sign of divine favor. And even in today, and th that type of attitude is coming back into um, play where, you know, a person said that they are rich and they ascribe it to God's blessing. Now, the truth is that God's blessing can make you rich. But there's also a lot of rich persons that are rich and it's not God that really grant them these riches. And it's not, well, let me say that again. It's not because they have favor with God while they, are, while they are rich. There are a lot of folks that God despise, but they are rich. And there are, a lot of, there are a lot of persons also that are poor financially, but are rich when it comes to the things of God. Now, we need to understand that it's not because the man was rich why I'm going to hell. You know, it's not because he was rich. And it's not because Lazarus was poor why he went to heaven, you know. But the man would have gone there because of his lifestyle and because, you know, his riches clearly to him was like an idol, you know. But Lazarus, um, though he was a beggar, obviously he made it right with God and was able to make it into eternal life. So, so as the scripture says, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by angel into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, we believe that this gives us some insight as to what happens after we die. You know, if you are in favor with God, if you are righteous in the eyes of God, then you will be placed at a place that is called Abraham's bosom, a pleasant place, a comfortable place, you know, as you await the resurrection of, 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 and, and the judgment of God. But if you are not in good standing with God, then when you die, you know, you're going to be placed at a place of torment. Here the Bible talks about being Hades or in hell. And so, you know, it is important for us to understand. And this, as I said, this, script, this story gives us insight as to what happened after we die. Now, uh, and there are some things here in this story that we can't really, we don't really see anywhere else. Like for this, the Bible said he lifted up his eyes 
and, and saw Abraham's afar off. So he was conscious. A lot of folks debate that point, whether you're going to be conscious after you die. But here the, the, the scripture gives us some insight there. The scripture says that he lifted up his eyes. He was conscious. He saw Lazarus. So Lazarus, though he died and would have um, gotten out of his physical body, right? Because when we die, our body don't go with us. Our physical body don't go with us. Yet, the man was still able to recognize Lazarus. How was he able to recognize Lazarus? I'm not sure. But obviously, he saw him and he knew that he was Lazarus. So that's, as I said, that gives us further insight as to what happened to us after we die. Um, he went on to say, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix. Um, again, it seems as if, you know, you can probably see, we call it paradise. Some people call it paradise. The Bible here refers to it as being Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort. But he could see him. He could look over there and see Lazarus over there, you know. He probably would have seen other people. He could have probably seen other people. He recognized Lazarus and hence he wanted to call, you know, for him. Um, now, he made a request for Lazarus to come and give him water. That was turned down, right? But again, it, it shows that he was tormented. He thirsted. And now thirst is, a, again, a feeling that we have in our human body. But after he died, he was still able to thirst. And Lazarus could still receive and be, you know, in a pleasant, um, receive comfort. And, you know, so, so that emotion of being comforted, or, you know, he, he could still experience that, um, that emotion even after he died. Now, um, the Bible says that he, he asked for that and he was turned down. Then he asked, he asked for God to send back Lazarus to his brethren, his brothers, and to warn them. Which was a noble thing, I believe. And what did God say? Um, let us bring up back that part of that scripture. Um, I, I just want to look at, I just want us to, be, to focus on the wording. Because this is something that we see. Um, we see quite a few persons testify, actually, that they died and they went somewhere and that they came back. You know? So I want to actually look at the exact wording of the scripture um, to see what the angel said. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Verse 28. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and, and the prophet. Let them hear them. Verse 30. And he said, Nay, father, Abraham, but if one went, f went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Let me hear what he said. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophet, neither will they be persuaded, though one arose from the dead. Right? So, so he didn't say it's not allowed or permitted. He didn't say that. That's what I was checking for. Um, but the point here is that notice what Abraham said here in this story. He said, if they won't, he said, they have Moses and the law. What is Moses and the law? What is that? Is he talking about the physical Moses? No. He's talking about the book of Moses and the law. So, so the angel was saying, look here, they have the Bible. They have the Bible. And 
The man said, well, look here, if somebody, if someone come back from the dead and tell them, they would more likely to hear. That's what the rich man was saying. The rich man was saying, if someone comes back from the dead and say it, then they would more likely to hear. And, Ab and, and Abraham disagree and said, look here, if you, don't, if you don't hear the Bible, if you don't hear the Bible, then you're not going to believe even if somebody come back from the dead. You know what that tells me? That tells me that the word of God is the most likely thing to convince somebody to serve God. Yeah. Because, because that's what he's saying. He's saying that, look here, if they, if they don't hear the Bible, if the word of God, the anointed word of God, say the things that it says, and they don't listen to that, don't think that they're going to listen, even if somebody comes from the dead. You know, which is a point that, you know, the word of God is the most likely thing to convince somebody to serve God. All right? Let us continue. So I think that is this parable here. Um, as I said, the truth, there are some truths here that, that, we, that we discuss that I believe not, not parable, the story. You know, there's some truth here that we discussed that I believe. You know, not, not, you know, it was very insightful as to what will happen after we die. All right, so quickly, in, um, we're going to look at miracles. Now, what is a miracle? Before you turn to it, all right, what is a miracle? All right, um, what is a miracle? In your own words, I want you to tell me what is a miracle. Most of us have a miracle done in their lives. I have a miracle that the Lord did in my life. And I said, most of us can point to at least one. And I want you to understand that one of the biggest miracles that we receive from God is when he fills us with the Holy Ghost. That is a marvelous miracle. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you know, he can do the same for you. So let us look at uh, the definition of, miracle, of miracles. So um, this is the, the, as defined by uh, the Oxford Reference Dictionary. And it says that a miracle is an extraordinary and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws. Explicable here just mean explainable. By natural or scientific laws and is therefore attributed to a divine agency. So that is a miracle. Basically, anything that the, the fact that goes against the laws of nature. Is healing a miracle? Is healing a miracle? Give it some thought. Because remember we said a miracle is an extraordinary and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific law. So I would say yes and no. <laughs> yes, miracles are, healing can be a miracle, but it's not all healing is a miracle. Now, naturally, you know, God created the body, God created with the, the body with the mechanism to heal itself. And so, within the body, there is a law, as it were, that governs healing. And so, if you get a cut on your hand, if you give it some time, maybe a month, it will heal naturally. And that's not a miracle. That's just a natural healing. Right? So don't, don't say that you get a cut and, um, you know, it heals in a month's time, which is what normally it normally takes. And you say it's a miracle. No, it's still a wonderful thing because God has so designed the human body 
so that it is able to heal itself. It is a wonderful thing that God has done, but it's not a miracle in itself that you are healed. But um, we find that Jesus did a lot of healing miracles. There are a lot of miracles that were in healing persons, you know. So, but yes. So yes and no. So naturally the body heals itself, but there can be a miracle where God bypass the mechanism in the body that is govern healing and just do it. And one of the one of the um, one of the characteristics of divine healing is that it is in, it is instant. You know, even though even though because because as I said, the body heals itself. So one of the one of the characteristics of divine healing is that it's instant. But we find a couple cases in the Bible that was miraculous and it wasn't instant. You know, as I said, time won't allow us to look at a lot of these, you know, but we're going to look at a couple miracles here. So um, don't quote me on this. I believe there are 37 miracles. Jesus did about 37 miracles in total that is recorded in the scriptures. As I say, I believe, I just did a quick search for that. I didn't check it myself. Um, now, these miracles included the catch of fish, right? So, and and, and, and um, on a three occasions, Jesus actually allowed his disciples to catch fish, miraculously as it was, you know, we are. Um, yeah, so there are three occasions that was done. One with the when he catch a fish and in the mouth of the fish there was some money to pay the tax. And then there were two where his disciples was fishing all night and didn't receive and, and was unable to catch any fish, you know. And then after Jesus would have come and and, and they would But are these really miracles? Is this an extraordinary thing? Because one might say, well, why you call this a miracle? Because I catch more fish than that already. You know? Or some, you know? So let me hear what you think. Because this is something that some persons are on both sides. You know? Is the catch, is, is, is the catch of fish where Jesus said, throw down your net here for a drought and then, you know, they did it and they were able to catch fish, even though they weren't able to catch none before. Was, is that considered a miracle in the true sense of the word? Let me know what you feel. If you think it's not a miracle, then tell me that, type it in the text that it's not a miracle and say why. And if you think it is, also type it in the text and say why. All right, so I'll allow the discussion to, to go on there. But let us continue. All right, so we can move. We can move on. So you can find the catch of fish. One of the one references in Luke five verse eleven, um, one to eleven. All right. Okay, so these are list. This listing that you're seeing on your slide on your screen now is a listing of some of the miracles that Jesus did that weren't healing. You know. So as I said. By far, the majority of his miracles had to do with healing because he had such great compassion for the people and for those that were sick. You know, but there are some, there are some um, miracles that weren't, that no healing was involved. And these are some of them. I don't, I don't believe I have all of them here, but this is probably the majority. So Jesus turned water into wine. That is the first miracle that he did actually. He calms the sea, seas. I think he probably did this more than once, if memory serves me right. Um, he walked on water. Um, he fed 5,000 plus women. And he also fed 4,000 plus women. Um, then there is the miracle temple tax in the fish, or the, the, the temple tax that you know, um, was needed. You know, he sent a man to catch a fish and the tax was there. He also cursed the, 
the fig tree and it withered. That was done in Bethany. And he did, he also, as I said, the catch up fish, he did it twice. So these are some of the miracles that Jesus did that did not involve healing of anyone. All right, let us continue. So the first miracle that Jesus did, um, John, let us look at this one. And I think this probably is the last thing we'll do. So on the third day, there was a marriage. On the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciple to the marriage. So we find that Jesus and his disciples were called to the marriage. Um, person believe that the reason why Jesus and his disciples were, well, the reason why Jesus was called was because Mary, Jesus' mother, may have known the person that was getting married. And so that is why an uh, invitation was extended to Jesus. And that Jesus would have probably brought his disciples. Continue. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Right? Now, I find this very interesting that Jesus' mother came to him and said, they have no wine. Can, let us continue reading, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Jesus says unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. So obviously, Jesus and his, this, and his mother was having some conversation there. All right, next. His mother said unto the servant, Whatsoever he said unto you to do, do it. Now, the question that comes to mind is that Jesus' mother was so sure that Jesus was going to do something. Jesus was not a, a wine dealer, right? He wasn't a connoisseur, that's what they call the word. So why did Jesus' mother was so convinced that Jesus would do something. And he had done, and as I said, this is the first miracle that is recorded in the Bible. And the writer said this was his first miracle. So, you know, I can't explain her faith. I can't explain why is it that she had so much faith that he was going to do something. If he has never done it before, if he has never done a miracle before, you know, he had, she had so much faith in him that he was going to do something, you know. And the Bible said it was the first miracle that Jesus did. And anyway, let us continue. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jew, containing two or three fir firkins apiece, right? So there was a lot of water there. Right? Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Right? So Jesus said to them, fill up the water pots with water, and they fill it up. Right? And he said unto them, draw out now, and bear unto the governor. Now notice, you know, Jesus, Jesus is like that, you know. Jesus is like that. He said to give it to the governor. He didn't say give it to the servant. He didn't say, he did. There were so many other folks there. Jesus looked for the biggest one, the one that if you're going to give the governor water in, instead of wine, it would be the most embarrassing. I mean, you could just give an next person, right? Wouldn't have been so bad. But Jesus, Jesus looked for the worst, as it were, the 
highest rank, one of the high rank person that was there. I'm not sure if the governor was the highest, but one of the high rank person that was there. Jesus went, um, said that, draw out the water. It was water at the time. And, 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 and give it to the governor. Now, this, is, this took great faith. Because remember, you know, it was water that they, they pour in the pot. Right? So it took great faith for the servant to draw the thing out with water, not tasting it before, and just bring it to the governor and expect that it would be wine. And that is how... That is what faith is. You know? Faith is, as somebody says, it's putting on the pot, upon the fire, and you don't have what is going to go in it. You know? Faith is, um, one person testified that they buy car tires, and they don't have the car. That is faith, right? Faith is doing the thing in anticipation that God is going to do his part that is going to make it make sense. Now, now it would have been stupid for, the, for some of the things that we do in faith. If God doesn't come, if God don't come true, you know, it's going to look foolish. You know? It's going to look foolish and there's no way it's not going to look foolish. And you can't explain it to nobody. Everything, as everything happened to you, and you just can't explain it. Because if, if you try to explain it, it's going to look more ridiculous. You know, you just can't explain it. And this is one of the things, this is one of the things where, you know, um, if God doesn't do his part, if God didn't do his part and change the water into wine, and he will give the governor water for drink. He just can't explain it. He's just, he's just going to look stupid. You know? And, and that is, but that is faith. That is faith. We are trying to acquire a piece of land, a, a, a building. We are, we, are, we, are, we are trying to acquire a building. And we are, we are doing it by faith. You know? It's by faith. If God doesn't step in, and do the thing, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because we don't have enough money to give for it to happen. God has to step in and do the miraculous. And as a, as just like how it kind of looks stupid, where if the governor, if, if the servant draw the water out and, and bring it and God didn't do his part, they would have looked foolish. Even so with us, you know, if God don't step in and do the thing that he say is going to, you know, do, do a miracle for us to acquire the place, you know, then it's going to be hard for us to explain it, you know. But, but that is what faith is. That is what faith is. I mean, you step out in faith, you have to just step out in faith and believe that God is going to do the rest. Right? So, continue. And, and he says unto them, Draw, yeah, go ahead. Next. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, so she didn't know where it came from, but the servant which drew it knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. Now what is good wine? And when man has well drunk, then that which is worse. Thou hast kept the good wine until now. So the, so the governor said, the governor was saying that, This wine that I'm drinking now was much, tastes much better than the wine that you gave me before. And, you know, why you do that? People normally do the, the opposite. Now, there are some things that we could infer from that, but we're not we're going to leave that alone. Um, let us go back to the slide. It 
So as I, as I said before, um, you know, it's, it looked as if Mary would have known. Um, it appeared that Mary was a close, Mary was either a close friend or a relative of the bridegroom. Her relationship to the family is probably account for the invitation extended to Jesus. So we said that before. So the miracle is a revelation of Jesus' interest in us. So, I mean, when I look at it, at first I was kind of, I don't want to say disappointed, but his first miracle, I was looking for something more, you know, different. I was looking for a different miracle to be his first miracle. Maybe heal the sick or, you know, something that shows you how much he loves humanity and all of that. But his first miracle is turning water into wine. That is his first miracle. And here it, it tells us that Jesus cares not just about our, self, our soul, but he cares for us as a, as a whole. You know, he cares for every aspect of us of our lives. Jesus cared that the wine would have run out and the people them would have, and the, the groom would have been and the bridegroom would have been embarrassed. And he didn't want that. And so he, he did a miracle to supply the wine because there is faith there. His mother had a lot of faith in him and the servant that took the, the water there and brought it to the governor displayed tremendous faith and belief in God without even stopping to taste it to see if it would really change or not. You know? Um, note that the names of the bridegroom are not mentioned. So again, that underscores the fact that it's nothing about them that was special. It's something that he did for them, but he will do it for anyone. He will do it for you, he will do it for me, he will do it for anyone. You know, so the names are not even mentioned there. All right, let us move on. The miracle is a sign of the purpose of Jesus coming into the world. He came to transform and to transfigure. Just like how he transformed the water into wine, right? Um, even so, you know, he came to transform our life from sin to righteousness. The miracle showed Jesus, Jesus' method of working. So this miracle, the first miracle, it shows his method of working. So the water became wine with the aid of human hands and divine authority. So that is how a lot of Jesus' miracle is done. Human play a part in it and then divine authority. Notice when he was raised Lazarus from the grave, there was, a, there was also a component. This um, principle was at work here, human intervention and divine authority. Someone had to roll away the stone. Even, I believe it was even before, even before he raised Lazarus from the dead, someone had to roll away the stone. And so it's required of us to have this action that demonstrates faith. Rolling away the stone is an is a action that would demonstrate that you believe God is going to raise the person from the dead and he's going to need to come out of the grave. Come out of the grave. And so you are moving the stone so that when God raises him, he can come out. This is the same vein that is done here with the water turning to wine. The man, the, the servant would have had to believe that somewhere along him throwing the water in the, in the pitcher and, beer and, and transitioning to the, where the governor was and pouring it out somewhere along the line there, it would have been transformed from water to wine. And so this is how Jesus operates. A lot of times we... we sit back and we want we want it's as if we want Jesus to turn the water into wine and we taste it and then we move and say yeah I'm gonna go to the governor now you know but but the principle that he te he's teaching us here is that 
Yeah, man, you can move at the thing before Jesus do it. You know, you can, you can, you can move at it. You know, is there something that you asked God for? You know, what are some of the actions that you could do to, to, you know, in demonstration of your faith to God, not to man, but to God? What are some of the actions that you can do? Maybe you can do, think about those actions and do them in anticipation of God answering. And um, I believe this is the last, the last point here. Jesus saved the best for last. So, you know, the governor, this is coming from the word that the governor say that, you know, um, you have saved the best wine for last. Um, Mark you, the, this slide here, and I should give, give credit to the book that I got it from, is, is taken from a book, I think it's called Overseas Examination. Um, I forget the exact name, but it's, it's, it's actually, the discussion is actually taken from a book. And so, um, Jesus is saying here that, well, the writer is saying here that the New Testament dispensation is the greatest of all ages God has yet given unto us. So he's saving the best for last. The point is that the, great, the, the period of time that we are in now is far better than the law and what preceded the law, you know? Um, the dispensation is, speaks about grace and you know, dispensation of grace where we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, where we are baptized in Jesus' name. We have to repent of our sin. That is seen as the best um, dispensation to date, you know, that you are, that you are in. All right. All right. So that is it for today's um, lesson. As I said, I hope you would have get some truth from what was discussed here today. Um, I am actually going to take a break now. It's not the end of the series, but um, I'm going to actually break and allow someone else to um, whether start a series start a series of their own or so I won't be here next week. So you know it was good being here and discussing the scriptures for these couple of weeks and I you know as usual my prayer is with you and I pray that you will also pray for me and for each other. You know that at the end of it all we will all make it into the rapture. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for your words. We thank you, dear God, for being here with us. We thank you, dear God, for everything that was said here today. Dear God, we pray that you will help us to hide it in our heart, hide the word in our heart, so that we will be impacted by it. Have your own way, O oh God, as we give you all the glory. You alone is worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you all.